Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Regina Lam, Director of the VEV Industry. So welcome everyone to tuning in with us for the VEV Industry Spotlight, transitioning from the indie to professional set, Suji Wenkesh, uh, sorry about that, Sujit um, Wenchikis at the 25th Annual Vancouver Asian Film Festival, VEV On Demand. Um, before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the land that we are broadcasting at. It's the unceded territory of Musqueam, Squamish, Slavitu, First Nation, as well as Massasaga of the Credit, the Anasalabe, the Chibera, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wingdam peoples. And I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, presenting sponsors, Canada Media Fund and public funder, Canada Council of the Arts. And um, we'd like to introduce our moderator for this fireside chat today, Louisa Fung. She is a writer and award-winning director based in Vancouver, BC. Her film, Home and Grace, was nominated for Best Canadian Short Film at the 2021 Regina International Film Festival and Awards. And she's currently developing her first stage play, Embers of the Past, with the help of Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre, MSG Labs, and the Play Playwrights Theatre Centre. With over 15 years of experience, she has worked as a professional assistant director on shows such as Apple's, C's, CW's, The 100, The Netflix, Lemony Slickety, a sweet series of unfortunate events. Let's welcome Louisa. Hello. Um, we also like to acknowledge that today is a day of remembrance um, as we honor the people who served and sacrificed for our country. Um, thank you for joining us to the 25th anniversary of the Vancouver Asian Film Festival in this chat with Suji Varigas. Um, uh, he has over 100 stream credits as an actor, currently appearing as Dr. Singh on the award-winning TV drama series Transplant on CTV in Canada and NBC in the U.S. He's known for creating the iconic characters, Mr. Meta in Kim's Convenience and David Pastor as in The, the Expanse, among many others. He is an award-winning screenwriter and the very first uh, visible minority to attend the prestigious Canadian Film Center as a writer-director. His short films have won numerous awards and uh, he is the subject of one of the shorts, um, part of VAF uh, in the Reclaim Your Name um, campaign. So welcome, Suji. Uh, hello. Can I can I just correct the pronunciation of my name? Yes, please. It's it's Sujith Varigis. Varigis. Sujith Varigis. So and names are very important. So yeah. thank you for correcting us. Um, uh, my legal well, name is Louisa Fung, but it's you know you can call me Louisa. That's fine too. You know it's it's um, yeah. You think about it. We only know how to say the name Michael because we know how to say it. But if you look at it. Why would you say it the way we say it? So it's only because of the anglicization of the world that nobody knows how to say names like ours. Um, but that's why I'm here to <laughs> here to help. Thank you. So your career um, has spanned, you know, four decades. Um, and you started in Canada and then went to school in the states, and then has made quite an impact in theater as a writer, uh, as a writer, um, and as an actor. Can you? Um, Tell well, me not when, theater so much as television. Well, then definitely television. So can you tell me what inspired you to pursue a career in entertainment? I uh, was the first, you know, I come from a family of doctors, an Indian family. My dad was a doctor. His father was a doctor. I have two uncles who were, I mean, a uncle who was a doctor. I have two cousins who were doctors. My younger sister's a doctor. Uh, so I, I was expecting to be a doctor. And um, uh, I was the first pre-med drama double major at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. I grew up in Saskatoon. Uh, I was born in India. My parents came to Canada when I was a year old. Uh, my father was a doctor in India and he came to Canada to study to become a neurosurgeon. And at that time, the only place that would accept an Indian doctor to train in neurosurgery was the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. So that's where we ended up. And um, I grew up in Saskatoon. Um, 
Uh, but uh, Saskatoon, uh, as a lovely city as it was, was not a huge theater center. So after a couple of years of, uh, of university, I decided to transfer to the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, which is a very big theater program. And Minneapolis at that time had more theater than anywhere in the United States, except for New York City. Um, so for that reason, I transferred there and I did my undergraduate degree there. Um, and, um, and, you know, at that point I was, um, I had, you know, I had a theater arts degree, uh, and what am I supposed to do with that? Well, I had, um, I had, I had a typewriter and I wanted to get into film somehow. And I didn't have an uncle who was a movie producer. Um, so I wrote a script, uh, as a way of figuring out if I could get into the film industry somehow. I used that little script, it was a short script, uh, to get into the first graduate program in film offered in Canada, which was at York University in 79. And I went to um, York. And while I was there, my one of my profs was a executive producer at CBC. And he was, um, and so I gave him my little script just to get his opinion. And he liked it enough to invite me to pitch an idea for a pilot, sorry, for a series that he had done a pilot for. And um, so I did, and and uh, and they liked the idea, and they ended up writing an episode of this series, and that's how I broke into television as a writer while I was in still while I was still in in uh, film school, um, and I, you know, basically worked as a writer. And then the second thing I did for CBC was a movie. Uh, I wrote a a, a a TV movie that I ended up starring in. Uh, it was like the first multicultural romantic comedy that CBC ever did. And frankly, I think it was the last multicultural romantic comedy that CBC ever did. Uh, and we couldn't cast it because the lead character was an Indian guy who'd grown up in Canada and looked and sounded like me. And there were no actors then. And so um, the CBC sent the casting director to Los Angeles to find somebody and she came back and said, I found him. And I said, who? Because I'd never heard of any brown actors in LA any more than here. And she said, his name is Howie Mandel. And I went, I don't think he's a brown guy. She says, no, no, he's a young Jewish boy, but he's very funny. And this was a comedy. I said, oh. So they sent the producer and the director to LA to audition Howie Mandel. And this is before he's famous. Painted him brown. Um, and um, they decided that wasn't a good idea. And at that point, the CBC was going to cancel this movie and my career was over. So I begged them to let me audition for my own movie and they let me audition. I got the part. And that's how I started acting. And that was in 1982 and the movie was on in 83. And it was pretty high profile at the time because it was on the cover of, you know, we got reviewed in McLean's magazine. It was on the cover of uh, all the TV guides and it was nominated for a few awards. And um and it got really good ratings, except it was only shown on what was called the CBC owned and operated station. So only 16 stations across the country even showed this thing. But it, it got, you know, 750,000, 750,000 people watching it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I started acting and, I, and continued writing. And I've done that pretty much ever since. Did you consider changing your name when you went from writer to actor? Uh, well, at that point, it was too late. I mean, I, I never expected to be an actor. Um, I, I really dreamt of being a director, and I figured breaking in as a writer, um, who cares what my name was? I knew it was a problematic name in terms of being in show business, but I didn't think it would be... I know, you know, I was young, and I, I sold my first script pretty quickly, and, you know, before I knew it, my name was on screen. And it was, you know, now it's too late to think about changing it. Um, I considered, you know, I had a lot of people think, you know, once I started acting, I said, you know, you really should change your name because it's too complicated. Uh, and and who knows what my career would have been like had I changed it. But, um, you know, I didn't. I'm, I'm the only boy, you know, my sisters, uh, and I don't have kids. So, you know, my name was going to die with me. So I figured, well, at least it'll be on screen somewhere. So I kept it. Um, how has Asian representation changed from when you started to now? And like the, the, 
like community has it how has it changed from when you you know over the course of your career well when i started there was no community i was it um i had no peers i had no role models i had no people who'd gone before i could say oh that guy's on tv i could be on tv um uh, you know i i when i think back on on how um solo of oh, solitary i was how i had no i mean it was almost because i was uh, such a pioneer that i didn't know any better i decided to try and do this i guess um but yeah i i i i mean i even tracked in in my the first 10 years of my career all the characters that i wrote uh that got produced i probably employed more uh visible minority actors than any other writer in the country if you count up all the characters in the first 10 years of what I wrote, um, because I was the only one writing anybody. You know, the first thing that I mentioned that that pilot uh, or that series that I, I saw the pilot for and I got to write an episode of, it was a spy show that CBC did starring Don Franks and Elizabeth Shepard as a Canadian spy and a British spy who meet every week for an affair and an adventure. And I wrote an episode where the guest star was was black was a black a young black secret agent who was whose wife had been beat up at a at a protest rally by what turned out to be Ku Klux Klan guys who'd come into Canada. And so, you know, there was this whole kind of cultural component to what I was writing even then. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I kind of take a little bit of credit for keeping or getting people like myself employed on on TV screens and at least in the in the early 80s and in, in the early part of my career. But no, there was no community. Um, I would say 10 years into it, the community started to to happen. So the people that I know who are working now, that's when they came into the industry, you know, in the in the late 80s, early 90s. And now it's a vast community. Uh, the, the the you know the number of uh, both behind and in front of the camera, it's um, there's no there's no comparison. How does it make you feel to see that community grow? Well, I, I'm I'm thrilled. You know, I I I can't imagine what it would have been like had I been trying to break into what is the industry now, compared to what I was breaking into 40 years ago. Um, I mean, in a way, it's harder because it's more competitive. You know, I didn't have anybody to compete against. They either wanted me or they didn't want me, but they weren't choosing between me and another writer or another actor who, who was selling the same, you know, the same cultural or, or, or physical or creative um, uh, material. So, you know, I, I mean, it's hard to say which, which era was easier to be somebody like me trying to break into. Um, I mean, I just had my own experience and that experience was that as, a, as of a pioneer and looking at the community now. I mean, I sit on the board of AFPS, which is the pension and insurance program for the Writers Guild and for ACTRA. And I see all the stats and our highest, you know, I mean, our highest earners are, are in their 20s and early 30s. And there's so many series regulars and series leads who are brown and Asian now. Um, I mean, it's just uh, I can't even compare to, to like like I said, I had we had to we were almost cast Howie Mandel because we we couldn't find somebody who, who looked like me. Um, when you were so you like both work professionally and independently, um, producing your own works as well as working within like the studio system um, as an actor and as a screenwriter. So can you tell me a little bit about producing on your own work versus? working uh, on a on a professional level i don't do very much um independent work for myself other than in development um like i don't i've produced a few things that are sort of on the corporate and industrial side um but in on a development side you know working developing projects sure that's 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 me um but so i would say that that you know, when I started, there was no independent industry, or 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 not even into. I don't even know if it's an industry. There wasn't there wasn't an option for independent work. You know, um, it really was 
television, uh, movies, uh, and movies were also sort of um, active uh, back then, but there was a, but nobody, and still to this day, I don't think people make a living in, in movies because they're so sporadic. Um, they might go back and forth between a movie and a TV uh, project, but, but you didn't really, but you could, you could uh, make a living in television. And that's how I started. I started in television, series television in particular. That's how most of the people, uh, you know, cultural issues aside, that most of the people I know when I started, that's what they do. Um, it's it's a unionized, you know, industry, and and you learn a lot on the job, and you know, you you become part of that that world where people know who you are and they hire you based on your reputation at that, at a certain point. And, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an industrial uh, model. Um, I also work on independent projects, mostly as an actor, sometimes as a writer, um, which are not, I mean, the, the union issue is not quite as um, established. Um, they, they're unionized in terms of the cast because I wouldn't work, I, I don't do non-union work, um, but they don't have to have union crews and stuff like that. Um, and you know, so I have a, I have a fair e amount of experience working in both um, types of, uh, of 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 projects, and and you know, they are similar but not the same. In my experience. Um. So was there? Um, any roadblocks you encountered, like coming up, and maybe, or you know, something that stuck out to you that really, like, maybe set you back for for a while, and then and then you pursued anyways. I'm sure there were tremendous roadblocks, but I was so naive and so, you know, dumb. Uh, I I didn't I didn't see them. That, I mean, that's how I look at it back then. You know, like when I started acting for example you know i had to write my own movie to star in and get that part in order to start acting but after that point how do i keep acting well i knew that i was the only brown actor in the country probably but certainly in in one of the few in toronto and uh, i took my picture and my one line resume by hand to the casting agents that i knew i didn't have an agent just directly to the casting directors and let them know if you need somebody who's like me, I've got some experience now and I've been nominated for a, a award for acting in this movie and, and people knew who that movie. And so they, they were happy to, to get that in there for their files. And um, I mean, that you could never do that today, <laughs> you know, like the industry is just not that open, you know, so on some level it was easier uh, but on another level, I had to have the gumption to even consider doing that. And I meet a lot of young actors today who wouldn't dream of doing that. I mean, it just wouldn't cross their minds. And I didn't have a choice, right? So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, it was harder for me then or, you know, harder now. I think the, the issues are just different they're probably more um opportunity there's far more opportunity now than when i tried to break in i had to create my own opportunity now there are you know there are programs that are soliciting diversity in their makeup you know so so it's hard not to be a little jealous of uh 25 year old filmmakers nowadays showing seeing all this opportunity that i i i feel that i helped create you know by by saying hey you know you can't just make it by luck and happenstance that i got to be in television you know you've got to make something happen because you know especially in our country where so much of our television and film industry is is really triggered by government subsidy right i mean the cmf finances television telefilm finances film not a hundred percent in either case but those are you know those are cable company and government funded programs, we all pay for them. So, you know, I should have, I, I should have the same opportunity as, as somebody else, because I'm, I'm contributing the same way somebody else is, right? 
So on that basis, you know, that that sort of is the argument to, for, for these programs that are attempting to fight the sort of institutional discrimination that we pointed out is real. And yeah. so now they have to make up for that. And, and they're giving opportunity for a current generation that never existed when I was starting out. I mean, the, the what's great about, you know, life today or the industry is today is that what, through social media and, and community, we're able to change policy. And one of the things that was recently changed in like last week um, was telephone changing their language restrictions because it used to be English, yeah. French, or native languages only like 50%. And now, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense because the, the, our our communities are not made up of just English, French, and native um, um, speakers. So this is like such a great opportunity for uh, racialized filmmakers to be heard. And thank you for being one of the people to kind of, you know, like break barriers down for people of color because uh, you can see, you can be it. Um, we have questions mm -hmm. from um, our Facebook Live. Uh, Barbara asks, you know, how can we activate those in the industry and how can we activate those in the indus industry to open more doors for more racialized filmmakers and creators to get their stories into production and be broadcast? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that there is a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of programs that are, um, that have opened doors that didn't exist when I was starting out. So, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's sort of hard for me to go, you know, we, we, we obviously need to do more. I mean, for me, what I realized after 40 years is that asking nicely doesn't work. Um, and um, we, as a community, are entitled to equal treatment, right? Um, on that level, you know, what is the argument? Well, the argument is, oh, well, we can't have quotas because quotas would, uh, you know, not, not be, uh, would, would take away the, the quality of it, you know, and I'm going, dude, we are in an entertainment industry. The quality is subjective. I watch stuff all the time that I think sucks. It doesn't mean that it, you know, I'm right. It just means that it's an opinion. So once you, you know, when you, when you realize that it's all subjective anyway, I put that quality issue aside. Now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't make professional quality. It just means that what you think is is good needs to be at a professional standard, but it may not be to my taste. So once you once you make that as your as your ground rule, then quotas actually make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, the per percentage of the population uh, of of South Asian people in Canada is like you know five percent or something. Well, five percent of the CBC should be brown. Uh, uh, you know, what's what you know, two weeks of the year, you should be not see nothing but brown people on the CBC. I mean, you know, on some level, I believe in that argument now, and I know that for, for many years I didn't because I thought it was wrong to, to demand quotas, but now I think, you know what, uh, otherwise it's always subject to somebody's, uh, you know, oh, I like that guy or I like that woman. And I'm going to give them, you know, the, the gatekeepers get to decide. And I don't know how much merit I put into gatekeepers anymore. You know, the, the gatekeepers, it's all subjective anyway. And and we've seen that there have been questions called into gatekeepers uh, already in our industry. And, and maybe we should take the power of subjectivity away from the gatekeepers and, and just make it, look, you know, maybe the show will suck, but it's part of that, their, their quota. And and they deserve to have something on, whether it's good or bad. And hopefully if they do it, they'll learn if, it, if it's bad to make the next one better, you know, but not, yeah. to, not to give them an opportunity at all because you subjectively think they should, you know, that I don't think that holds water anymore. And I think that, you know, giving people of color uh, the opportunity to actually show and to fail means that we're just going to get better and become like, because if we don't fail, then how do we get better? And so, right. I and here's, the other, here's the caveat to that. Um, if I've been successful, it's because I learned from the best. I I did not, and and that's where I think there's a big gap. And I what I talked about 
I think why we we chose this theme for this talk today is that what I was able to do by being able to break in when I did and then learn on the job in a, you know, the CBC, it's it's a high level operation in terms of what you're expected to be able to do. You're expected to have to deliver professional quality product, right? Um, you, 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 you know, the opportunity to fail exists, but it doesn't mean it's going to be on TV. It means that, you know, okay, that show's got, got, didn't happen. And, you know, maybe you'll pitch something else and it might get further and, and get green lit. But, um, you know, I had to learn the hard way on the job to improve what I was doing as a writer, to get better as an actor, to, to learn from the best as I, uh, you know, and I was working for people who were smarter and better than I was. I, I After I did that movie for CBC, the next thing I did was I wrote for the Muppets. I wrote for Frank. I was one of the original writers for the now iconic TV series, Fraggle Rock. I wrote 10 episodes. I worked for Jim Henson. Jim directed one of my episodes. You learn a lot working for the Muppets about how to tell stories on screen, how to create something that holds an audience's attention how to make sense and communicate to a, a camera the story. And, and I learned real stuff doing that. And if I made a mistake or if I failed, my script didn't get produced. I, you know, that was, that was how it worked. Um, now we have a generation that's able to generate product without having to work for anybody to do it. And you don't necessarily learn from the best because you're making it yourself. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying there's a, um, I, I, there's a inability or a lack of opportunity to improve based on having to deliver to Jim Henson that I had that uh, somebody starting out today may not have. And I think that is a big gap um, because while it was probably harder for me to break in, once I broke in, I could learn. Um, now it's a lot easier to break in, but people are breaking in independently, doing their own work, putting it up on YouTube, all this kind of stuff that, you know, may be useful and, 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 and creative and expressive for them, but not necessarily operating at a high professional level because they haven't learned from somebody, you know, I haven't had to deliver to a showrunner or a producer who's got four series under their belt uh, on, on, on the, the script. and. You know, nobody's saying it's it, nobody's um, canceling their show, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, I think that's an interesting uh, issue to take into account that that a current generation is able to sort of generate a lot of product without having to learn on the job, um, and uh, like I did, and I know that I know more now than I did when I started, not because I'm so smart, but because I learned from the best, and that opportunity. I think something um, uh, uh, this current generation may or may not have, and I, I, I wish they did. Um, Clement Lau asks, um, with all the different platforms available to showcase your work, where would you focus on if you were trying to break into the industry today? Well, I think it depends on whether you want to make a living at it or whether you just, you know, you want to be expressing yourself creatively. If you want to make a living, um, it's television at least in, in Canada. Um, um, you know, so if you're a, if you're a creator, you need to go the, you know, it's a, it's a basic route. You got to write scripts that you can then try and sell. You'll write a spec script. You'll write a spec of modern family, and then you'll write an original pilot and you'll network the hell out of yourself in order to get those scripts into the hands of people who could, possibly hire you. And the fact is people get hired. So it's not impossible to break in. And that's how they broke in. They wrote enough stuff. They had enough in their portfolio and they met the right people and at the right time. And, and now they're staffed in writing rooms, writing for a series. And one or two of them will eventually get to create their own series, but it's not going to happen when they're just breaking, just starting. It'll happen once they earned their stripes and paid their dues and got a few shows under their belt and then you know they those people i mean that's how television works right um and i think that's applicable in all all sectors of the industry whether it's behind the camera 
or in front or writing or directing or whatever. Um, if if you are just you know needing to to create something and get it out there, there's a million platforms and there's nobody stopping you. When I was breaking in, or you know, when I was in film school, you needed hundreds of thousands of dollars and a Arri 16 millimeter camera, and you know, you needed a, a, a fair amount of support in order to to get something done, and that that wasn't easy to find. You know, this thing is a better camera than any camera that shot the first 20 years of shows I've ever been in. Right? So it's it's all doable. You just may not make a living at it. The platforms are there. The the democratization of the technology is there. What is important and what I don't think you can buy, you have to learn, is the the knowledge of how to tell a story. Um, and uh, that's that's hard to learn on your own, you know. That's why I say I learn from the best. If there's a piece of advice you would give Asian filmmakers and actors who are entering into the industry, um, what would it be? Read. Read. Like film books or anything, everything? If you want to write scripts, read scripts. Um, you know, I see you've got McKee's book over your shoulder. All those books are great, but you know, reading 10 screenplays is probably more valuable than reading one screenwriting guru's book. And none of those screenwriting gurus ever wrote a screenplay anybody paid money to see. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying they were wrong, but I am saying that Aristotle did that stuff first. But what you need to learn how to, you know, it's like being learned to be a carpenter. If you want to learn how to make a table, study tables. Learn what a good table is. Deconstruct the tables that you find to learn how to put them together. Take a course in joinery, you know. Um, and the same thing applies to creating, you know. Read, you know, study the great masters. If you wanted to be a painter, you would go to the Louvre and, and see what da Vinci did and study the great masters. Well, our industry have great masters. And, and what's so incredible about your generation is that you don't have to pay for it. Like when I started, when I had to learn how to write a script, there were no screenplays online to look at. There was no, there wasn't even, you know, Sid Field hadn't even written his book yet. There was nothing. There was Aristotle. And I went to a bookstore and I found two screenplays in published paperback form. I still have them. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Citizen Kane. And I read those two books a million times and deconstructed how those screenplays worked. And that's how I wrote my first script. Now I have 600 screenplays on my hard drive, all downloaded for free uh, from, you know, all sorts of legal sources on the internet. There is no excuse for, for a filmmaker not to do, have done their homework. And, uh, and, and I, I get passionate about this because I used to teach and I found very few um, young people had actually done their homework. So I would make references to movies or TV shows that they'd never seen, never read. And it, it, it drove me crazy because it gets to the point where they come up with this genius idea, they think, and I say, oh yeah, that's exactly like that show I saw 10 years ago. And they're going, well, I've never heard of it. Well, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You're just, you're reinventing the wheel here. Right. But if you'd known what had gone on before, then you'd be able to build on that in with your own story. But if you don't know what's gone on before, you run the risk of just rehashing what's gone on before. And I don't think you can afford to do that. You know, like our generation or this generation is up against, there's a much higher level of professionalism required to break in. There's a much higher level of, of um, you know, ability required to break in. And you, you have to have done your homework so that when you present something to somebody who can say yes or no, they're going, oh, I've not seen this before. This is this is a unique voice with a unique vision, and those people hopefully have done their homework enough to know what's gone on before. Now some of them haven't, but um, but you know that's what I would that's what I would encourage because that doesn't cost you anything. I can't get you I can't get you a job with the Muppets, but I can 
get you to you know to read screenplays. So do you see the transition from like indie filmmaker and content creator into professional by like like what is the transition? What were the steps kind of to become a professional? Well, I mean, there's a there's like I said, every story is different. You know, my story on 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 starting from scratch and becoming a working professional is my story. Everybody who is now a working professional, whether they've been doing it for one year or or thirty years, each story is different. But there's some common things, which is that they did their homework, they got a portfolio, whatever that means. You know, whether if you're a, if you're a camera person, you've got a portfolio. If you're an actor, you've got a portfolio. If you're a writer, you've got a portfolio. It may not be stuff that you got paid to do, but it's stuff that shows your ability, shows you what you have to offer, and networking in whatever way you can to find the person who can put you in the place you want to be, and uh, becoming part of the industry. You don't have to get a job to become part of the industry. You have to, you know, just become part of the industry. Do you know what I mean? Like it means like yeah, going, to, going to film festivals, meeting other filmmakers, making connections, but you can't just, I mean, lots of young people who just do that. I'm going, okay, so where's your script? Well, I don't have a script. Well, then you're not employable, right? Uh, but then the other side is I've got, you know, the, I've, I don't know if I've met anybody, but I'm sure there's somebody who's got all these scripts list sitting on their hard drive, but they don't go to a film festival or they don't go to a face. They don't join the Facebook group or they don't do whatever it takes to become part of the industry. So nobody's ever going to read their material. You got to do both. So you both, you have to both do the work as well as network to be known. So that way people can see that you've done the work and that you're an option for, um, for leveling up and, and bringing me into the writing room as maybe as a junior writer um, or, or as a, you know, uh, an actor on set. Now there's another question we have um, and it's from, I'm going to, I'm sorry if I butcher it, but it's Akshaya Patanayak. Um, as a Canadian actor, do you feel short change since most prominent roles are cast out of LA? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't feel shortchanged because I work uh, pretty steadily. Um, I would say there have been times when I felt shortchanged, but I, I, you know, it's such a, it's such a, uh, what's the word, serendipitous business that, uh, you know, sure, you, you lose one job to somebody who moved to LA, but they're Canadian and they got cast in the show here once they moved to LA. I mean, we've heard a million of those stories and I didn't move to LA. Um, and, you know, you walk past um, in Toronto, there's the Walk of Stars, you know, on, on King Street in front of the, you know, it's our, it's the same as they have in Beverly Hills, but that walk of, and you look at every single star on the sidewalk and there are hundreds of them, but ours are not just uh, entertainment. There's athletes and all that stuff. But if you look at all of them in the entertainment industry, None of them live in Canada, not one, right? So we're, as a country, really good at patting the Canadians who left on the back. <laughs> if you're so good, why are you still in Canada is sort of the mentality that we have. Um, so you have to recognize that that's our culture, that we don't really respect our own. We only respect people who go elsewhere, get, you know, in some American show and now, oh, then there's somebody good. But somebody who stayed here, you know, nobody cares. That's our culture. And, well, now and, that we have but I, streaming I, but I, platforms. Sorry? sorry? Well, now that we have streaming platforms like Netflix and Amazon, and now they're, that we're not just beholden to American networks, do you feel like Canadian no, but actors... No, those are, are still cast the same way. Right. You know? um, so, but what I'm saying is that... that you could decide to be really you, look if you're um i would not say don't move to la in fact if you're under 40 i would probably advise you to move to la if you're looking for a career path now re remember that you're now you know where whereas before you had 100 people you're competing with now you have 10,000 people you're competing with but that's how it works 
Um, and if you succeed, you're going to succeed in a way, you know, my friend Simu Liu is a good example. I mean, he got cast on Kim's Convenience when he lived in Toronto and he knew well enough that, you know, as soon as he got that, he made his move and he was in LA, I think from season one or season two on making those connections happen for him there. So that, you know, season four, he gets cast as the next Marvel superhero, you know, we knew that was going to happen on some level because he didn't stick around here, but to stick around here is you're saying something else. You know, I, I um, choose to stay in Canada because I like Canada and I want to have the lifestyle that I have and all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with, with the career path. And you have to make that decision for yourself. So, so when the question is, do I feel shortchanged? No, I don't feel shortchanged. I recognize that's the reality of our industry, right? And what, I, um, what I've learned to accept is, yeah, I'm not going to have the opportunity as the same as a Canadian that went to LA, but I'm okay with that. Um, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't say you shouldn't go. I think it's actually makes a lot of sense for people to go. And, and it, it, but it is not worth being pissed off at, at people getting, you know, cause that's how, just recognize that's how the industry works. Right? And, and it doesn't mean that you can't have, you don't have the chain, the same chance here you do. Um, but you know, they're, they're looking there first. So uh, we have one last question um, from Cindy O'Young. What is the biggest mistake or mis some mistakes that you have seen someone make that has been an indie filmmaker, but now on a professional set? Being temperamental. Um, when I when I work on sort of the, the 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 not student films, but the low budget independent projects, I see a lot more temperamentalness um, in in that on those sets, and they get away with that on those sets because you know it's that's not then nobody's going to call them on it. If they had that same behavior on a, you know, a, on a regular TV show or, or, you know, unionized set, they'd be fired. So um, I would say you have to learn to be a pro and temperamental temperamentality is not professional. You know, one of my mentors was Dan Petrie senior. It was one of the great, Hollywood directors and but he's Canadian and he directed a raisin in the sun and all these great films and and he, he was one of my teachers at the Canadian Film Center and he, he would say to us um, I'm the most temperamental person on a set and I'm not temperamental anybody who's more temperamental than me doesn't is not there the next day and you know that's that's the attitude, you know. And so I would say that's that is a clear demarcation. Do whatever you can to be a professional. Yeah, I completely agree. I I work as an AD on set, and um, as soon as a PA, very first day as a PA, which is a production assistant, as soon as you're on a union set, you are a professional. So you have to act accordingly. So um, I'd like to thank you so much for being part of VAF. Uh, the 25th anniversary and this wonderful interview. And I'm just going to throw it to Regina. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Regina, you're muted. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for everyone who um, uh, listening to our uh, fireside chat and uh, thank you Suchit, uh, thank you Larissa and um, to join us today and they so um, we still have an uh, ongoing with our VF on demand until uh, this Saturday so today we just launched three international shots program and um, one of the shot that uh, we mentioned earlier that with Suchi is in there is here's the subject with um, with that uh, five minute shot is under the reclaim your name campaign so it's in one of the shots program uh it's called international shots in search of purpose and value and then uh tomorrow we'll launch canadian shots program 
and then also have a Fong Ong Female Kids talk taking place at 5 p.m. tomorrow uh, Pacific time. And then if you want to see more different um, programs and panels, uh, go to vef.org um, to learn more about it, uh, like what you see and what you saw, and then tell your friends, um, like our Facebook, share it uh, through you know Instagram, Facebook, FF Vancouver, and then hashtag FF, hashtag FF25. And um, thank you so much, and you guys have a good evening. Thank you.